this is what we went into this field for. When you're in school, you're learning about public health, you learn about pandemics, you learn that something like this can happen. You know that it doesn't happen often, not at a global scale like this, and you hope that it won't happen in your lifetime, but here we are. It's happened in my lifetime, and I'm in the seat now, and it's my turn to deal with it. I was CDC director from 2009 until January 20th of 2017. We covered a range of emergencies from the H1N1 influenza pandemic to Ebola, Zika, MERS. The current pandemic is the most disruptive international infectious disease event in more than 100 years since the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of disease in a population. So basically we look at how infectious diseases spread through communities and how we can stop them. Some early analyses from this pandemic looked at what the case fatality risk is, which means of people who get sick, how many die. The case fatality risk in the U.S. right now is around 2 to 3 percent, but that's not the entire picture because we know that there are many people who are infected who do not get counted. We think the fatality risk is somewhere around 0.6%, which is actually many times higher than seasonal influenza and indicates a pretty severe pathogen. Whose heart is hit by a pandemic like this is really much more a sociological question than a medical or biological question. It's who are the people that are in occupations and that have lifestyles that require that they go out and put themselves at risk. And this is disproportionately people of color, African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanics. We know that death rates for COVID-19 for African Americans are somewhere around 22%, while they represent about 13 to 14% of the U.S. population. We don't fully understand the transmission pattern of it. We know it can be transmitted or the virus can live on surfaces. We know now that it can be in droplet and, and, and now or aerosol as well. How common are those different mechanisms of transmission and how best do we do it? We know that it is possible for people who go on to develop symptoms to actually start spreading even before they get sick. And that's quite common. Maybe in the neighborhood of 40% of all transmission events are with pre-symptomatic individuals. There's also asymptomatic infections, which are people who never go on to get symptoms. They have no idea that they're infected. This is a harder thing to measure, but it is probably not small. It's probably higher than 15%, but less than 50%. We know that it is possible for children to transmit the virus but we don't know whether they are more likely, less likely, just as likely to transmit as adults, particularly asymptomatic children, which is actually a large fraction of, of kids who are infected. There's still a lot we don't know about how to optimally treat the virus. We don't have preventive treatments where if you're exposed, you could take it and not get ill. One study, well done study that came out, showed that only about 13% of all people who were hospitalized for this were completely free of symptoms even two months later. We don't know what the long-term consequences are, but we do know that there may be longer-term consequences for some people. The good news is that people can fight off the infection and they end up with an immune response that's strong enough to do that. How long that immune response lasts is that going to be sustained over time? Can you get infected a second time? We don't know the answer to that. Now, what's the bad news? There are seasonal coronaviruses that cause, you know, what we consider the common cold. You can get reinfected with exactly the same strain um, 10 or 12 uh, months after you get infected with that strain. And what that tells you is in that case, we don't have sustained immunity. What the implications are would be that you might have to be vaccinated regularly to provide protection rather than have a vaccine and have long-term protection like we have for many other diseases. There were some theories early in the pandemic that we might be able to, or we might by accident, reach herd immunity with COVID-19. It's clear that we are nowhere near herd immunity, at least here in the United States. Our understanding of the number of people who have ever been infected is somewhere in the single digits. It's 5%, 9%, maybe in extraordinarily hard hit areas like New York City, it could approach 20%. But we likely need to get closer to the 60% mark in order to see any effects from herd immunity. 
And that means that a lot of people would get sick and they would die. So of course, the, the, the question everybody wants to know is when will we have a vaccine? In general, vaccines take 10 to 15 years to develop. The fastest vaccine ever was a mumps vaccine in the 1960s. That took four years. The Ebola vaccine we worked on a few years ago took five years, and yet in this case, we're trying to narrow that down to 12 to 18 months. So this is unprecedentedly fast. Now we have um, uh, more than 25 vaccines that are in clinical testing now, and probably 250 vaccines that are being developed. But of course, eventually, we're gonna have to narrow it down to promising approaches. At the beginning, there will only be a small number of doses, no matter how much we scale up. So what we're suggesting is we start off and vaccinate all healthcare workers around the world. That is no more than 3% of the population. And then we distribute vaccine to try to get to the elderly and to high risk groups. And that takes you up to a floor of about 20%. After that, as more vaccines are developed, you can go further. But if we could get to that 20%, we would dampen the global pandemic and we could move towards um, a, a, a more a normal existence, if I want to call it that. But if we do it where a small number of countries uh, have all of the vaccines for themselves, you could end up with a situation of 30 countries having vaccine and then 170 countries having none. That would not be good public health, but that also would not be a, an ethical and right thing to do um, for the world. We can't predict what's going to happen with this virus in warmer weather or in the fall. Right now, all over the world in 100 degree temperature, you have explosive spread of the virus. On the other hand, meat packing factories and slaughterhouses in Germany well, that's an artificial winter and you're seeing explosive spread there. So could it be worse in the winter? Possibly. Can we rely on it to go away in the summer? Obviously not. October is the beginning of flu season. So if we have a spike of COVID at the same time that we have an increase in influenza cases, there's going to be even more demand on the healthcare resources. We have a lot to learn about COVID. We have only had this pathogen for around six months and it can take years or decades or even longer for science to get a really complete understanding of how a pathogen behaves and how it causes disease in people. A vaccine is a, a substance that you usually inject or give to a person. And what it does is it tricks the body into thinking that it's been infected with that organism. And by the way, the reason it's called a vaccine is because the original vaccine for smallpox was actually coming from cows, and vaca is the word for cows. In general, vaccines take 10 to 15 years to develop. Are there animals you can use to test these, designing different candidates, testing them in animals, and then getting to a place where you have something promising, and then beginning a step of slow clinical trials sequentially to see what dose is required, are they safe, do they give a good response? We're trying to do two things. For upper middle income and, and high income countries, we're asking them to self-procure vaccines, to put some money up front, and in doing that, we'll be able to invest in at-risk manufacturing of these vaccines to build up doses in case they work. For the lower and lower middle income countries, we're asking donor countries through their overseas development aid to provide financing so those countries can have subsidized vaccines. And of course, we're asking companies if they are going to tier prices to try to keep the prices for the lowest income countries as low as is practically possible. As somebody who's worked in the space for a long time, I actually think we will find a vaccine. What I don't know is the duration of that protection. And that's why it's important we not only have many different approaches um, in the queue now, but also that we continue to work. And, and maybe even second generations or third generation vaccines will come in as we better understand the organism, we understand the immune response, so that we can have the optimum products.